Oops, guys. Come on, get big. Okay. Ah, all right. So I, I, I don't know if I've told you six or seven times yet, but this is a place I traveled once. This is somewhere else. All right. So I wanted to, I gave you my office hours. I changed the office hours. I posted it in an announcement. We're going to have poll questions, then current events. Then you'll review your daily food plans. I wanted to remind you to sign up for the To Your Good Health um, assignment. And if you haven't signed up by Wednesday, I will put people in the people who haven't signed up, I'll put you in the remaining groups. Pay attention to the deadlines. I'll try to keep you up on them. Then next class, we'll be talking about food allergies and intolerances. I made a videos, I put things into videos for that so I can hear about individual situations. I posted the assigned food issues for you. If, as I said before, if you have a food intolerance or a food allergy, let me know, let's change it. Be that person because you already are. <laughs> All right, any questions? Because I know that some of the comments had to do with explaining assignments and concerns. And so this is also time for me to clarify things. No clarification needed? Okay. So yes, please sign in. Last name, first initial. Okay, you do not need to register. Don't register. And then I don't need to have these hidden. I just need to find my mouse. I'm going to stand up now. Let's here. All right. Three, two, one. Okay. Why are energy recommendations, the recommendations for calorie intake, set at 50% of the population needs and not 97%? because only half the population needs to eat. The RDAs are set to cover practically all healthy individuals. 50% of the population does not need 95 or 97% of the calories. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Let me say something about this question. Um, I used to, I'm not sure I'm going to be giving multiple choice questions on exams. I think they're going to be more short answers, but this is a question where the statement that 14 of you marked is correct is true. However, that's, that statement is true, but it doesn't answer the question. All right, so this is a case where you have a true statement, but it's not answering the question. That happens on exams sometimes. People write things that are correct, but they're not addressing the question. Okay, so I don't know that you'll need to remember that for this class, but it does happen. So what I want to explain to you first is that the, for example, for vitamins and minerals, the recommendations are set to cover nine, about 97% of the population. We have what's called the estimated average requirement, which is if every person in this population was consuming 40 units of this particular nutrient, 50% of their needs would be met, 50% of the population. So the recommendations are set to standard deviations above the median to cover practically all healthy people. Now that's for vitamins and minerals. However, when we talk about calories, 
it's set in the middle because 97% of the population does not need to be eating 97% of available calories. So the recommendations are set at 50%. They're set in the middle. And of course, as with all of these, individuals' results vary. But when it comes to vitamins and minerals, on the left, the RDAs, the recommended diet daily requirements, are set to cover practically all healthy people. Right? It's, it doesn't only prevent deficiencies, um, but it covers a wide range of healthy. And that's the important word, is healthy. If you're not well, if you're sick, if you're injured, those needs may change. But on average, the RDAs or the DRIs or whatever the acronym is are generally considered sufficient. The ingredient lists, the ingredients on a food label are listed in descending order by weight, true or false. When you look at a food label and you're looking at the ingredients, they're listed in descending order by weight, true or false. Five, four, three, two, one. Right, so the answer to this is true. We're talking about the ingredient list. <laughs> this wasn't the one I wanted to show you, but these are, <laughs> these are cookies that have a vitamin pill stuck in them. <laughs> but if we look at the, if you look at the, the nutrient panel, I mean, it's got everything in it, but the number one ingredient on this list is sugar. That means that by weight, it contains, it's the largest amount is sugar. Then we have wheat flour, vegetable oils, partially hydrogenated oils, which means that there may be, there are some trans fatty acids. Um, what you should know is that if something contains less than 0.5 grams of trans fatty acids per serving, that can be called trans free. But foods are no longer supposed to have trans fatty acids in them because they've been shown to cause increases in blood cholesterol. I don't know what they're replacing them with. What, if you look farther down here, you see things like calcium carbonate, ascorbic acid, iron orthophosphate. Don't be scared, all right? Calcium carbonate is the mineral calcium. That's why this product has 30% of the recommendation for calcium. Iron orthophosphate is iron, and that's why this product contains wherever the iron, 20%, that's huge. Right, so they're listed in descending order by weight. Oh, okay. I wanted to show this as what I call a, a dysfunctional food, but somebody brought up, and I think I included it in my roundup, what nutrient dense was supposed to be. These are a conflict to me because they are nutrient dense. This is their advertising, these cookies. And what really bothers me is I like the way they taste and I don't want to but they're really nutrient dense. They're also calorie dense and I'm conflicted about them. So I don't buy them, I ignore them. If I want a cookie, I'll eat Oreos. If I want this kind of sandwich cookie, if I want something else that has nutrients in it, I will eat something else that has nutrients in it. This way, like Oreos. <laughs> so Oreo is one of my favorite cookies on the food label. The top ingredient is also sugar. And you'll notice that when we go down here, the vitamins and minerals are, are lower down on the list because you don't need as much. That was one of the things that I said about vitamins and minerals. They're micronutrients because you don't need as much of them, milligram, microgram amounts compared to macronutrients, but that doesn't make them any less important. Oh, apparently I wanted to show you this. Is anybody, I can't see you all because I only have like, six people showing, but has anybody ever seen this yogurt at Trader Joe's or like this yogurt? I just bought some of it this morning. I'm not getting any money from Trader Joe's <laughs> to publicize it because this label has on it milk made from cows not treated with RBST. Does anybody know what that is? Has anybody ever heard of that? It's a hormone that cows get in order to 
Go ahead, Sasha. Um, isn't it illegal to actually use that, that growth hormone in the U.S.? Um, I don't, I think, I don't know the answer to that, but if you send me an, an, an email, I'll look it up. My, um, I don't think it is. I think this is a recombinant bovine somatotropin. It's a hormone that, that cows already make that I just remembered what it was. Um, I don't think it is. I think there are other hormones they might not be able to get because this is some, the bovine somatotropin cocktail chatter is they already make it, but people don't like to have genetically <clears throat> whatever in their food so that they have this on their label and i just want to show you that right below it they say there's no significant difference has no significant difference has been shown between milk derived from cows treated with artificial hormones and those not treated with artificial hormones so if there's no difference why do you think they put this on here I think like when people are reading labels, like if they see that, though, they just might think like, oh, that's great. Like, I don't, they might not even notice like the bottom part where it's, where it's saying no significant difference. Because if I'm reading it, I'm really going to read what's in red and I'm not, I probably won't read the fine print. I think these are when you have folks that are what I call chemophobes, afraid of chemicals. And when I, there, I, I go back to dihydrogen monoxide, but there is no difference nutritionally or otherwise between cows that have been treated with this and cows that haven't. And yeah, I think it's, it's marketing, but I buy it because I like the way it tastes. All right, so, oh good. What's the first thing you look at on a food label? Added sugar, serving, calories, ingredients, meat, serving size. Okay, I'll give it a couple more seconds. Three two, one. All right, so it looks like calories <laughs> gets it. A lot of people are looking at calories. Um, why is somebody looking at wheat? Is it because you, it's an allergy or a um, gluten issue? Yeah, whenever I pick up a a label I always look to see that's the most important thing for me anyway and then I'll look at calories okay and is it because you have an allergy or an intolerance yeah okay so then let me know and um, I'd like to make sure that that's what you have on the on the assignment you know on the food issues okay so just oh it is oh. I looked the other day so it's all set <laughs> I live to serve um, protein why are folks looking at protein Um, I said protein. Sometimes I have like trouble getting enough in my diet, so I try and get it from dairy sources like yogurt, um, different types of meat, primarily like poultry, fish, things like that. So just like seeing what the protein content is per serving size. Do you do you have a history of not getting adequate protein in your diet? Um, it's definitely like one of the lower nutrients or like lower lower um, macros that I tend to intake, but I try and um, fix that and like build it up and just like keep an eye out for things. Um, so this will be something interesting when you do the diet project, you'll be able, you keep your food records for three days and I ask you to do it for two weekdays and one weekend day. Cause I don't know, sometimes people eat different on the weekends and see whether or not the recommendations, you meet the recommendations, you know, whether you're, you are under or over. Um, ingredients. What are you looking for when you look at ingredients at the ingredient list? I, put ingredients. Um, I also look for gluten, probably the first because I have celiac, but also like a lot of times things that say they're, they're very healthy, like when you look at the ingredients, they have a huge long list and it's clearly very processed and not as healthy. Well, um, why, what does process mean to you? Um, like a lot of the times, for me at least, like I tend to go towards like natural 
of natural foods, like like very like little ingredients, I think. That's what it means to me at least. Um I don't know, like officially, but I think when things have a lot of ingredients, I tend to not feel as good when I eat them afterwards. So I like more natural foods just because I have a lot of stomach issues. <laughs> So even though the things that might be added are things like thymine mononitrate and pyridoxal phosphate and ascorbic acid, which are vitamin B1, B3, and vitamin C, does that bother you? No, no, no. I'm just talking about like, for example, like turkey, like sliced turkey. A lot of the times it has like a bunch of added ingredients while there's more like natural brands. So okay. stuff like that, I tend to go towards the more natural brands. Okay. So I think in... If we were in the classroom, I would go, in our little kingdom where I'm the benign dictator, I might get on you, you know, to explain to me what natural means, because natural doesn't mean that it's healthier. I'm, I'm like less processed ingredients. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I know what you're trying to say. So I think what we're going to, what I might do, and it just to get you to be clearer with your language, all right? And, and I know when people say they don't like processed foods, I know they're not talking about the baby carrots, you know. No. They're talking about carrot cake or carrot muffin. Yeah. Right, right. So that's where my bias comes out. So, you know, slow me down if I get there because processing is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, all right. And when we talk about uh, bread and wheat flour, that before the Enrichment Act of 19-something, when people were just eating refined flours and bread, there were a lot of deficiencies that developed because when they started refining the flour, they took out the part of it that had a lot of nutrients and people developed deficiencies. And so those nutrients were added back into the flour in order to prevent them. Um, so, so yeah, I just, that's my question, but okay, thanks. Whoops. All right, so when I look at a food label, all right, so this is the food label. These are the new food labels. They're new to me because the old ones just had a bunch of stuff down here that didn't make any sense to me. But I, what I recommend to folks when I've worked with them is to look at the serving size because you may, maybe what you're looking at is um, protein or fat, but if the serving size is just a quarter cup, and you're just pouring it as cereal into your bowl, you might be getting five servings. And so I, I certainly think it's important if you're a label reader that you look at the nutrients that are of interest to you. But remember, just because one food has, is low in a nutrient, we don't just eat single foods, we eat meals. And so if you buy something that's low in one thing, that's why the, the guidelines that, that are talked about in all those videos are balance, variety, moderation, because when you only eat, let's say you're somebody, I'm trying to think, and that only, you know, that, that drinks milk and, and eats dairy products, you know, you're a, a lacto vegetarian, but when you only drink milk products, then you are missing out on the nutrients that are found in other foods, all right? As great a source of calcium, the grammar is escaping me, milk's a great sort of source of calcium, but it's lousy for iron. So that's why it's important to eat a variety of foods. And it's just interesting because most, a lot of people, I don't know, you know, tend to eat the same thing. It's just a habit. And that's why it's important to kind of take stock every now and then and try to eat different foods. Going back to serving size though, whoops, I wanted to, excuse me, while I go into my closet here and get my food models. I've never shown them in this setting before. So let's see, can you see this? This is a bagel. Actually, this is four servings. This is like a Dunkin' Donut bagel. A serving size of bread is a half of a bagel, All right? So Dunkin' Donuts, I'm sorry, Dunkin' Donuts bagels are huge. What else? Where's my muffin? I don't have a muffin. Oh, yes, I do. All right, so I don't think you can tell from here, but this is a muffin next to my bagel. But this size of this is like the half of the top of a Dunkin' Donut fat-free muffin. This is considered one serving. 
I'm showing you this now after this assignment that you were supposed to do because I don't know that you knew what serving sizes were. And that's fine. Let's see. This would be a banana. This is maybe two to three servings, which is why I like to eat bananas because one of the hazards of my profession is that at the end of the day, I actually sometimes do think about, did I get enough servings? It is a hazard. This is one serving of juice. You can't tell because this is my 12 ounce mug and it looks almost the same, but a serving size of juice is six ounces. That would be considered one serving of fruit. The reason why I don't want people to drink juice is because chances are you wouldn't eat as much fruit as it would take to make the juice that you drink. I'd rather you eat the fruit. So I'm not a fan of juice. Juice is another name for sugar water. Granted, it may be natural sugar, or fruit sugar, but it's still four calories per gram. I'd rather you eat the fruit. Let's see. This is a serving size of fruit. I usually tell folks about the size of your, of a fist is a serving size of apples, oranges, peaches. Oh, okay, I forgot. I was at the base, of, when I was at the, this, <laughs> Oh my God, this does not work well. <laughs> this is a half a cup of pasta. That's considered one serving. For some people, that's one bite. <laughs> but this is considered one serving. But when you look at the recommendations, you're not recommended to only get two servings a day. They do recommend, depending on your height, weight, activity level, more than one serving. And this is a half to a third of a cup of rice. That's considered one serving. This is one of my favorites. This is three ounces of chicken. This is one serving. Now, again, if you look at the my plate, you're not just supposed to get one serving, but two to three ounces is considered a single serving. It's, if it's three ounces, it's 21 grams of high quality, complete protein. Um, so it's recommended to get, I don't know, depending on your demographic, a number of these servings in a day. But that's one serving. Let's see, last but not least, this is a tablespoon. In this case, it's got peanut butter in it, but let's say it's a tablespoon of peanut butter or cream cheese. That's one tablespoon. Not this. That's a heaping tablespoon. So when you stick your spoon in the ice cream and just take it out one time and say, well, it's just a tablespoon, it's not. Those are my serving sizes. Did any of them surprise any of you? You can just speak out. I have a question. Absolutely. So I was very surprised when I did my plate thing because uh, for me, it said that I can only eat uh, five ounces of protein per day. Okay. But then uh, I realized that I eat protein with all of my meals so I've been eating much more protein than I should mm -hmm. but for example as, as you as you mentioned that, that little piece of chicken it's already three ounces right. and then if I eat eggs with my breakfast like and that's it that's all the protein I can eat and I've been eating so much more like I it's thought not all the protein you can eat it's all the protein that you need based on the information you put into the program as long as you're getting your protein from food sources and your kidneys are fine and your liver's fine, you, you're not harming yourself. The concern is, you know, when people are taking large doses of powders or taking large amounts because they think this is what they need to build muscle. Using muscle is what builds muscle. Eating protein has nothing to do with building muscle. So it, it's the recommendation. But remember, we're talking about, you know, large populations of people with different needs. And I, I'm not, that's fine. My concern is more that people aren't getting enough or if you're getting too much food that has the protein and sacrificing other nutrients. And, and I thought also it was funny that it said that I needed um, three cups of, cal of milk per day or, and, and that's a lot, I don't drink milk. 
Right. And you can, so when, and this is something that when you get into your group, so milk is a source of calcium as well as protein, but it's also vitamin D. And if you can get those from other foods, that's one of the drawbacks of these tools. There's all the tools that are out there have pros and cons. That's why I'm giving you a chance to work with a couple different ones. But yeah, no, your, your points are very valid. And that's what, you know, I want to hear from you when, after you come back from the breakout groups. Yeah. So very, anybody else surprised at any of the serving sizes? Everybody knew them. Ah, my classes are brilliant. Oops, let's see where am I? Um, okay. I have something oh, sure. to add really quick, if I can. Um, I think th this wasn't now that I was surprised, but I remember the first time that I measured peanut butter out in grams because um, I used a food scale. That was really depressing. Um, just because when you measure out, I think things with a food scale, it really surprises you um, because even the serving size on the label, it might say it for a different amount of grams than mm -hmm. what the actual product is um, in weight. Yeah. And then it turns out that you have to like recalculate based on the size rather than the label. Right, yeah. It's, it's, an ob it's a good observation, right, right, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen while we have current events, so. All right. Oh, there are your faces and the bigger screen. Okay. So let me just, now that I'm seeing more of you, did any of you have any comments about the serving sizes or the food label information? Well, I kind of do. Tell what, so, Justin? So I used to calorie track a lot over the summer. Uh -huh. um, and I think kind of like what, Sa kind of what Sasha was saying, like, I think the biggest thing for me was was fruits because like they like they get these small little fruits and you just assume that they're like the medium sized fruit. But then it turns out they're like twice the size of what a, like a fruit portion is. Right. Now, again, keep in mind, there's nothing bad about that. You just, it's just we're creating an awareness now so that later on down the road, you can make choices with knowledge, make informed choices. That's what we're doing is you're learning how to make informed choices. You can decide that you want to eat it. You can decide that you won't or you don't have to eat all of it, or why are you eating it? Are you eating it for the nutrients or are you eating it for the flavor? You know, or for the textures? And at some point, can you throw out that nutrition information and just enjoy the food because you now own what you need to make the healthier choices and not beat yourself up about it? <laughs> Any other comments? All right, so, oh gosh. Really sorry, Professor. If you don't have like a scale or like anything to, um, like I, that was like the first time I had seen what like a serving size of chicken looks like, I guess. So like, if you hadn't seen that or you don't know, like, or you don't have a scale to weigh stuff, like how would you know that? About the size of your palm is three ounces or a deck of cards. Now you're in my wheelhouse. Yeah, a deck of cards, a thimble, or your, the knuckle of your thumb is a tablespoon of peanut butter, which is gross if you're going to measure it against your thumb. Um, yeah, uh, you know, a, a, I forget, a, a ping pong, not a ping pong, a tennis ball is the size of an apple or an orange or a peach. So yeah, we have ways of getting you that information. So, Thank you. Anything else? All right, let's do current events. Tori. Okay, so for my current event, um, I actually wanted to find something related to what we were going to talk in class today. Uh, the videos that I was looking at during the weekend, we talked a lot about uh, nutrition labels. So I found this article in which <clears throat> I think it was since 2013, this company called Conagra Foods, they, they um, had a lawsuit because they had this product uh, like a spray product uh, similar to the I can't believe it's not butter uh, kind of product yeah. in which they were saying that um, it could be kind of like under uh, it could be used interchangeably with butter margarine margarine is that how you say it margarine yeah. I say margarine and, yeah and the the lawsuit was they could the the plaintiff whoever did the lawsuit lawsuits were saying that they couldn't because uh, the labels were super misleading uh, because the amount of I think they call it uh, RACC which is reference amounts customarily consumed uh, which is which was supposed to be in the food label 
like requirements 0.25 grams and they were 0.25 grams but at the end of the day the judge say that it, it was a product that couldn't be used because of the what was it like the chemicals and stuff that they were using it was just the flavors uh, that made them feel uh, like a product that could be used as a uh, margarine or butter Huh, so you like a substitute. I think, it a week, I think it was a week ago where they closed the case. Mm. And I think it's crazy how they market they marketed the product as an interchangeable product for those kind of ingredients and they actually couldn't. So I think they changed the it was like, like in the California state law, it was they were able to use it, but federal law was super different. So mm. they had to kind of not do it all over again, but change some things. So that's interesting. Well, first of all, my understanding is California, if anything can be cancerous in any amount, they have to label it. So it's like, an, okay, this is anecdotal. So catch me on this. Even mm -hmm. tables have to have listed on them. These could be carcinogenic. I might be making them up, but it's California, so I'm not sure. What, but what you're saying, you know, I'm telling you, don't be afraid if you can't pronounce it. What I'm saying is you need to not be afraid, but to, you know, the phrase, trust but verify. So I don't know what those chemicals were. I mean, if they're vitamins and minerals, I don't know that I have a, a problem with that. If they are flavorings, I don't think I have a problem with that. I would want to look at the data. Sometimes that's a problem with law and science is that the people making the decisions don't understand the science. And we as scientists have terrible PR. You know, we don't sell ourselves well. Um, so I don't know what was in the product, but if they were trying to market themselves as natural, as much as I hate the word natural, mm -hmm. exceptions include, you know, um, I, I, I believe in truth in advertising. So I, I'd have to look at the product um, to form my opinion on it. It's yeah. interesting because they're like two types. So basically you can uh, market them as like fats and oils, which include barter, margarine, oil right. and stuff. And then there's uh, like spray types and they were marketing their product as the butter alternatives. Okay, okay, yeah. And it okay. actually wasn't. Well then, I thought it was interesting with my past law degree in this kind of stuff, which is none, I, I think that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Jackie. Hello, so um, in the video class you mentioned there's no such thing as like a preventative study. So this was labeled as one, but I'm gonna call it risk reducing <laughs> because of what you said. So it's- Last dismissed, of, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an, it was published in the British Journal of Nutrition um, and it says new research has shown some of our least favorite vegetables could be the most beneficial when it comes to risk reducing advanced blood vessel disease. Um, blood vessel disease is basically a condition um, in which our blood vessels um, reduce the flow of blood circulating the body. Um, and this is usually due to buildup of fatty um, substances, calcium deposits on the inner walls of our blood vessels, such as the aorta. So this study consisted of a cohort of 684 women, older women um, in Western Australia. Um, it started in 1998, so it was a very long study. Um, and what they found was older women consuming higher amounts of cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, um, and Brussels sprouts, which are typically everyone's least favorite vegetables, um, every day have lower odds of having extensive calcification in their aorta. Mm -hmm. which is like a main cause of blood vessel disease. Um, and this doctor basically says these women who consume more than 45 grams of these cruciferous vegetables every day, like which is essentially a fourth of a cup of steamed broccoli or like half a cup of raw cabbage, were 46% less likely to have this extensive um, calcium buildup in comparison to those who consume little to no vegetables every day. Um, and she goes on to basically saying that this isn't us saying only eat these vegetables, also incorporate other vegetables in your diet to have that um, good balance as well. Okay, so this is interesting because, well, we will talk about heart disease in module, for those of you with the book in module three, we'll talk about fats and heart disease. Um, I would like to ask you, before you all feel compelled to start eating Brussels sprouts every day, which you don't have to, although I understand they can be made with bacon, which does that negate the benefit? <laughs> what else would what else would you want to know about these people in the study? Is there anything else you'd like to know about them? They we know what the, what their cohort what their age range was. 
I would also want to know, is there anything else in their lifestyle? And this may already be also be in the study, okay? We just didn't look at the materials and methods. What else is going on in their lives? What's their economic status? Are they working? Do they exercise? What else is in their diet? Do they, did they correct for all those things that may also influence their risk of disease? Is their family history? Did they separate those out when they, or were they just looking at cruciferous vegetables? So those are, before you feel compelled to a life of heart disease because you hate cruciferous vegetables, there are other things you can do um, to reduce your risk. So I, those are just, the, and that, I'm glad you, you said that. So these are just other things to think about. And I happen to like broccoli and Brussels sprouts with bacon, um, you know, and those foods, <laughs> but um, yeah. But I also take Lipitor, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank Mar you, Professor. Marissa. Hello. I'm looking at um, little thing. But... You see me? Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to look up, like, I looked up um, the, like, top um, diets that people like. And there's one that has been um, ranked three years in a row as the best. And it's the Mediterranean diet. And I, had, I hadn't really heard of it before. Um, but it said that it was just, like, based on the diets of people from Crete, Greece, and Southern Italy, and supposedly it shows a low rate of heart disease, chronic diseases, and obesity, which just kind of seems pretty vague. Mm -hmm. um, and it focuses on whole grains and good fats and veggies, fruits, fish, and low consumption of any non-fish meat. Um, but it seemed just kind of like a pretty generic and straightforward diet, kind of how like a lot of people just eat in their normal day. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it was for people that like spend time eating with their family and also, um, which was interesting, which a lot of people do. And also that um, partake in physical activity. And then just for an example for everyone, like a, a day in the life of a person that lives on the Mediterranean diet would be like oatmeal with walnuts for breakfast, fr uh, fruit for a snack, a green salad with olives, chickpeas and cucumbers, nuts for a snack and cod with vegetables and couscous for dinner. And I'm staring at Kat because that's legit what she eats in the day. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought, and then I looked at the pros and cons, nutritionally sound and diverse foods and flavors, cons, lots of grunt work and pricey. Oh, that's, um, that's yeah, so I just thought that was interesting to look up um, just cause I didn't know. And it just kind of seems pretty straightforward. I don't know uh, and what your thoughts were on it. Which is a problem for me, but yeah. What did you say? It doesn't include chocolate. Yeah, mm -mm. I couldn't do it. <laughs> right. um, I think it's good guidelines. These are all good guidelines. I'm gonna show you a study that was done on um, processed and unprocessed foods and weight control, but his recommendations at the end is keep in mind you have to have the um, ability to make these foods you have to have the time you have to have the money to buy them so in your real world is this what you can do and you're not condemning yourself to early death and dismemberment if you can't yeah okay yeah okay good thank you cat hello um so i follow this blog at a probably you guys know it it's called poosh it's like courtney kardashian's blog i don't follow it i bought like one metal straw from her website once so they send me emails every single day and i never look at them but this one i saw and i read the headline and it said like everything you need to know what you don't have to confess it's all right <laughs> oh. <laughs> well anyway so she sent this thing and it says like everything you need to know about the dash diet and I was reading it and it's also very vague, like similar to what Marissa was saying. And it, essentially it says, according to the American Heart Association, um, an estimated 103 million US adults have high blood pressure. Like that's how the article starts. And then it goes on to say like the DASH diet essentially is um, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And it's a dietary pattern used to lower blood pressure. And then when it tells you like what you should be eating, it seems, like basically just what anyone should be eating anyway. It talks about like you need to eat whole grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy, and then like lean chicken, meat, fish, nuts, seeds, legumes, fats, and oils. And I'm like, you pretty much just said every food group. But um, it essentially says that 
you should be eating way less sodium, like, and only five or fewer servings of sh sugar per week. So I just feel like anyone who's trying to lower their blood pressure would be trying to consume less sodium regardless. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like this is a uh, not even, I don't know, just one of those weird diet fads. So I thought I'd share. <laughs> well, okay, so good. I, 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 who, whose blog is this? A Kardashian person? It's a Kardashian, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the thing is that the DASH diet is a real thing. It was a study that was done over a long period. Oh, really? And, and, and we'll talk about this when we talk about heart disease. So one of the things we tell people when, or used to tell people when they have high blood pressure is stop eating salt. Well, the DASH diet showed that it may not be that people are eating too much salt, but they're not eating enough of the calcium, magnesium, potassium that are found in vegetables and fruits. And so when you start eating nine to 14 servings of vegetables and fruits a day, you don't really have room for a lot of foods that are high in sodium and where does most of the sodium in our diets come from? Processed packaged foods because it's a preservative and that's where those foods come from. So you're shifting the types of foods. So actually it is, it is a real thing. So as much as I feel myself hating to say this, go Kardashian. <laughs> is this the one that's married to Kanye? I think, is no, <laughs> no. Um, this is the oldest one. She doesn't like have a husband, but she has three kids. Um, mm -hmm. But I think really the only reason she put it on her blog is because they have a like stores named Dash and she thought it was cute. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Izzy, what do you have? Hi. Um, I found an article. I know that we mentioned it a little bit uh, last class about um, nutritional supplements that are labeling themselves like rather than like just a particular like vitamin it's supplements that label themselves as uh like they can fix your immune system and supplements that can actually like cure your cure you from diseases um and i thought the article was interesting because it talks about how there's two problems with this um the one problem is that there's so many people that like have these supplements that are in the article, they called them bad actors looking to profit. Um, and also that the FDA can't regulate them like for how many supplements exist on the market. Um, but I thought it was, it was interesting. It like went off of what we talked about. Would you send it to me? I'd like to have a look at it. Sure. Okay, thanks. All right, these were very good. Um, okay, does anybody have any comments? All right, let me go back to the slides. Let's share. Okay, let's see, where am I? Um, some of the people, I wanted to address some of these questions from the Padlet, Gabriella. Gabby, do you remember? Well, it's right here, so. I heard you mention in class that there's no such thing as a bad food, but I grew up thinking that foods such as sugary or fried foods are not good for you. What do you think based on our few classes so far about healthy or unhealthy foods? I think you asked me this last class also. It was just about like the dose that makes the poison. Is I, what I said I that. <laughs> okay, that's right, good. And Vic, Tor Tori, did I already address this one? Did I lose Tori? Vicky? I think she went to the bathroom. <laughs> and now everybody knows. So she had posted, there are some types of foods that can cause or are related to health issues and diseases. I guess I need to know specifically what she's talking about here. So um, I'll just continue without her and we'll come back. I wanted to just go over my current event, which is not current, but it's still reverberating. It was a study that was done by Dr. Kevin Hall at the National Institutes of Health, the effects of low fat versus low carbohydrate diets on energy metabolism, because the low carb community says that carbohydrates make you fat. The militant low fat community says that fat makes you fat. So what he did was he had, and it was a limited study um, with 20 adult men and women there were two types of diets over a two week period. It was what's called a crossover study. So both groups experienced both the low fat and the low carb diet. And both groups, they measured their weight um, and they looked at weight changes, but they looked at another, a bunch of other metabolic like blood sugars, blood pressure. Um, 
they look so it was called the ultra processed diets because there actually is a, a definition for ultra processed causes excess calorie intake and weight gain a one month inpatient so everybody stayed at this metabolic ward at the nih good times they measured everything that went in everything that came out ad libitum means they can eat as much as they want they measured it afterwards the results showed that when people were on the ultra processed diet they ate an average of 500 calories more per day and gained a pound of fat per week that they were on that diet. And this is without them measuring, it was just what they did. And when they were on the unprocessed whole food diet, they tended to eat an average, average of 500 calories less per day, making them in what we'll talk later about in negative energy balance to 500 calories per day. And they lost an average of one pound of fat per week. So this diet show, this study showed that ultra processed foods, people eat more without thinking about it. And with whole grains and whole foods, people tend to eat less without thinking about it. And this is what he said at the end though, when he was summarizing it, he said, however, advocates of policies that discourage ultra processed foods should be mindful that the time skill, expense, and effort to prepare meals from minimally processed foods require resources that are often in short supply, which was fabulous that he does this because we make recommendations are made without any consideration of people's individual circumstances, whether they have access to food, whether they can afford the food. This is like what, what concerns me about a number of studies that make pronouncements and Dr. Hall included this in his. Let me just show you what some of the meals were, the difference between the ultra processed and the unprocessed. So this would be a breakfast, you know, white food, what I call it, bagels, cream cheese, a fiber bar, because turns out that ultra processed foods are really low in fiber and they didn't want them to get constipated and drop out. So they actually got fiber supplements with each meal. The whole foods or unprocessed menu was, whoops, hello. Oatmeal, cinnamon, coconut, bananas, lunch, ultra processed <laughs> spam sandwich with American cheese on white bread, potato chips. Well, geez. The beverages here is crystal light with fiber in it <laughs> because you need fiber in an ultra processed diet. And on the right is the unprocessed. And then these would be samples of dinner on um, beef and chili with ch shredded cheddar and jack cheese, whereas on the right, I'm hungry now. Now, one of the comments that somebody said was, well, the ultra unprocessed food is so much better. I, why would anybody ever eat ultra processed food? The reality was that the folks in the study felt that both un ultra processed and unprocessed foods were equally palatable, equally appealing. So this study kind of showed that ultra processed foods, they have a mouth feel and a taste that people just seem to eat more of them. So that was, that's my current event. Not so current, but definitely eventful. Oh, I also made a note to myself. I forgot to tell you about how a, a phospholipid acts as a detergent. A phospholipid is one of the members of the fat family. We have triglycerides. Most of the fat is triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol. Phospholipids have, are made up of the three carbon glycerol backbone with two fatty acids, which makes them hydrophobic or water fearing. And then we have the water soluble molecule on the third carbon, which makes it hydrophilic or water loving. When we talk about digestion, we'll talk about bile, which is also a phospholipid, which has a hydrophilic and hydrophobic portion. What do I mean by detergent? It's like a detergent because imagine your favorite shirt, you're eating something and you spill mustard or not mayo or, or olive oil or some kind of fat on it and it's stained and you wanna wash that shirt because you're having company or something. If you just put that shirt in the washing machine, water and oil don't mix. So the fat's not gonna come out of the shirt. But when you add detergent, detergent has a water friendly portion, which will stay in the water and a water fearing, which will interact with the fat on your shirt. And then you have the action and the agitation of the water and that is supposed to pull the fat out of your shirt so it's nice and clean for when you have company. So that's what I mean by a phospholipid acting like a detergent. It's an emulsifier and we'll talk more about those.
All right. Um, I wanted to just review. I had on my notes that I was going to talk about the nutrient sales pitch. It just so happens that I made a video. So that's what's under the um, instructions for it. But I did want to show you a sample of what one student made for her sales pitch because I was so proud of her. So that was her less than two minute sales pitch. I don't expect everybody to do that, but we have to come up with clever ways of doing this assignment. Um, you can use padlets, you can make a flip grid. I have some examples in addition to this in the instructions video. This assignment isn't for a while, it's just that things are gonna come up quickly. So what will happen is I actually have it posted now that you can sign up in groups of two for a nutrient when we get to the vitamins and minerals. And I'm happy to talk to you about any suggestions or ideas for doing this, but that was because it was on my calendar. So I had to cover it unless I forgot like signing up for presentations. Whoops, sorry. And then for the diet project, diet and wellness project, I wanted to also start talking about it now because that's going to come up really quickly and I made a video for that. This video has all the information in this assignment, the forms on Black, um, Blackboard, remember the day, on Canvas that you need to use. Uh, if you have the access code, you can get started at any time, even if all you're doing is writing down what you eat over a three-day period so that you can analyze it using the access code if you're sharing it with someone. If you have any questions, talk to me and I will look at your project up till a week before it's due, all right? I will look at it, I will look at the forms, I will let you know if it's formatted poorly or if you forgot to get rid of your decimal points or if the math looks wrong, okay? So I just need to get that out there. I wanted to talk briefly about the recommended dietary allowances. People seem to think that, any questions? People seem to think that as long as you're getting the recommendation, you're fine. You can never have too much. And if you don't get the recommendation, you're going to develop a deficiency right away. That's not true, okay? Things happen over time. It takes time to develop a deficiency and there are risks of toxicities with certain nutrients. The one I'm thinking about in particular is vitamin D. While there aren't a lot of risks associated that I know of right now there with vitamin D because it seems to be a very popular supplement people take. It's a fat soluble vitamin and some of the things that I'm seeing in the literature are increase in fractures, which is kind of the opposite. Vitamin D is a bone nutrient among other things. So I just want you to think just because some is good. It doesn't mean more is better and you can't have too much. And that if you don't get vitamin C or if you don't eat fruit this week because of whatever reason, you're not going to develop a deficiency. Things take time. Questions? Professor, I wanted to tell you a little anecdote of mine. Please. That, um, it was like flu season or something and I was taking like vitamin C every day. And I have bought these gummies that are really yummy. So I will eat them as dessert of vitamin C and I got a huge rash just because of that. Really? It wasn't I because of vitamin C? Yeah. 
Well, the, the tail sort of is if you take something for a cold, it will go away in seven to 10 days. And if you don't do anything for a cold, it'll go away in a week to 10 days. So I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I don't recommend it. it. Take the gummies because you like the way they taste, but apparently you were taking too much. So you might have been mega dosing on vitamin C and that might have been an issue. Yeah. Professor, I have a question related sure. to that. So last class we were talking about like bioavailability. Isn't there like no such thing as like too many like supplements because your body doesn't absorb it all? Good question. No. <laughs> what will happen with fat soluble by that's up. Oh. What will happen with fat soluble vitamins is that we store them in our fat tissue. And so there's a risk for toxicity because we store them. Water soluble vitamins, not so much because we tend to excrete what we don't use except in certain cases because there's always exceptions. And there's exceptions to the fat soluble vitamin. But what, when, we're talk, when I talk about bioavailability, that's a good point. But that's with um, how much of it's biologically available. It doesn't mean that it's not affecting our body. It's just in terms of how much of it we can use for our benefit is limited. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. I just wanted to show you an example. Oh, I, all right. I wanted, we talk too much, which shouldn't be a problem. This is, these are two different food labels, two different types of peanut butter. One is low fat, one is regular. But if you look at the label, they both have 190 calories. And the thing is the low fat one, where is this carbohydrate? It has, where's carbs? Sugar. So just cause it's low fat doesn't mean it's low calorie. Okay, that's all, that's all I wanna say about this. <laughs> all right, so what I wanna do is put you in breakout rooms for 10 minutes. And I would like you to, in your group, I will, I would like you to, um, Take a snapshot of this so that you can see. I don't know if I have it posted, but basically how was this assignment for you? What food groups did you find you were deficient in? And what are some of the nutrients in those groups? Were you eating in excess? You know, you weren't, what, would, what do you think about your one day as compared to your usual dietary pattern? And what do you think about this as a tool for nutrition adequacy? Basically just kind of chat about how, what good or not good you thought this was. And please pick somebody, I'm gonna divide you, I don't have to see how many folks we have into like five or five groups. Pick somebody to um, lead the group and somebody to be your spokesman and somebody to just kind of write down what you're talking about, okay? So let's see. Hi, quick yeah. question, I was just looking at the assignments. The food issue, it says it's due next class or like, um, yeah, it's due on the 9th, but what do you, like, what exactly are we doing for that? The My Journal, your assigned food issue. I'm sorry, I need to thank you. Um, if you let me just write that down. It's not due then. It's when we talk about it. Okay, because it, it's, it, it's an upcoming assignment, so it's a little, conf that's, I'm still getting used to Canvas. Me too. It's just too. confusing. Yeah, um, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm glad you asked. No, it's not due um, then, it's, uh, it's, it's when we cover it in class. And I, yeah. okay. okay, thank you. Um, okay, any other questions? All right, so there are 28 minus two or, well, all right, I'm gonna divide you into five groups and give you about 10 minutes and then talk, we'll talk. Okay, go to your room. <gasps> I know it's not funny, except to me.
Oh, wrong mouse. 